Say amen again. Amen. Yes, sir. We are so glad to see Daryl back with us. Amen. We have missed him over these last few weeks. And uh, just so good to see him so passionately involved in the song service. And it's just a blessing to see him, Brother Daryl. So good to see you, brother. God be praised. God be praised. So good to see all of you. Uh, we miss Daryl because he, we know he's been uh, away sick from us. But it's just great to see everybody today. Uh, it's a blessing to have a reasonable portion of health and strength so that we can come together and fellowship one with another and to show our love one for the other. God has been good to us, and his mercies endureth forever. And we serve a good God today, and uh, we're just so thankful that he doesn't deal with us according to our merits, because um, we're just grateful that his grace is sufficient, and it is a free gift to us. Uh, we're just uh, so glad that God is saw fit to extend to us another day and another week. Amen. Let us go to God in prayer. Our Father and our God, we are thankful for this day, a wonderful day that you've given us. We're just grateful, Lord, that as we come to the last Sunday of this old year, we're looking forward to the Sundays to come in the new year and those days that have been set before us. We're just grateful, Lord, that you have saw fit to give us this day and we pray, Lord, that all things done and said will be pleasing in your sight. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer for thy people and for the good of us all. Let us all say thank you, Lord, and amen. amen. It's grateful it's to have this opportunity. Uh, to stand before you. I, I, we, we meet in the back, as you know, the brothers, as we prepare for worship. And it's just a beautiful feeling to stand in a circle with the men of God, to prepare ourselves to come and lead in worship, to prepare ourselves to minister to each other. And I am just really, really thankful. Brother Richard mentioned in our circle today how fortunate we are to have a group of men to lead in our services here at this place. Uh, and if you go somewhere else, you'll find out that uh, it is not all as, uh, as good as we have it. Amen. And so we don't take for granted Amen. this opportunity. Amen. And we just praise God that he saw fit to bring us here together so that we could work here in his vineyard at the church of the boulevard. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk to you today in the spirit of this holiday season, when people are in such a giving mood, uh, or at least they're supposed to be. And uh, people seem to be a little more merry during this time, uh, will have a little more joy in their hearts at this time. We wish it would last all year, but uh, we find that soon after the 25th, it begins to go back to business as usual. But uh, in the spirit of merriment, uh, in the uh, Christmas spirit and the love that we tend to share with others, uh, I just want to talk about uh, the subject of love this morning and how we should continue to love one another. And that's going to be uh, the launching pad for the words uh, coming to you today. Um, and, you know, as Christians, this is a great opportunity for us to take advantage of people's moods, because you can talk about Christ during this time of the year and maybe not be able to do it at other times of the year, because people are in that mood, okay? And uh, hopefully we've taken those opportunities to share uh, Jesus to people who normally don't feel like listening during other times of the year, they do so during this time. But for us today, I want to talk to us as Christians about love one another. If you come back tonight, we'll talk about how we are to experience that love with the world. Okay? 
But tonight, today, we're going to talk about our love for each other. And it is critical, vitally important that we understand a couple of concepts as it relates to that. It is very, very important. Uh, if you will turn to First Peter, hopefully you didn't lose your spot when Brother Murray was reading uh, in the scripture reading and meditation this morning. First uh, Peter 4. Um, we'll start there and move to a few other scriptures. I want to make just a couple of points this morning. This is going to be a short runway and a short flight, so uh, we won't be long this morning. Okay, First Peter 4, verses 7 through 9. If you're there, say amen. amen. Okay. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Peter's admonition to us this morning is our behavior in a hostile world. You see, verse 7 talks about our relationship with God. And verse 8 and 9 talks about our relationship with one another. You see, both of them go together. You can't have one without the other. And in this hostile world, God expects us to set the example for love and how we love each other. Let me illustrate it with uh, the cross standing behind me. If you notice this cross, it has two bars a vertical bar and a horizontal bar. The vertical bar represents man here at the bottom of the cross being reconciled to God in heaven, vertical. The horizontal bar represents my relationship to you, us to us, across a horizontal bar. So you have vertical and horizontal. If you take one of them away, you have no cross at all. Christ died to bring man reconciled to God and to reconcile man to man. You can't have love for God and hate your brother. Because now you have violated the cross of Christ. So our relationship with God is not in and of itself by itself. Because we have to have love for each other to make the cross. And so my uh, admonition to you today is to understand that it's not just about how we relate to God. It's how we relate to each other. So Peter says, act as though Christ is coming back today. Live your life in such a way as that you anticipate his coming today. That's why he says in verse 7, but the end of all things are at hand. In other words, if you live thinking that Christ is coming today, you're going to be acting all right. You ain't going to act a fool because you don't want to get caught acting a fool when Christ returns. So if you live like he's coming today, you're going to live righteously. And so Peter says, live like that so that your horizontal, your vertical is correct. Then he says in verse 8, above all things, above all things, fervent love one to another. Okay? That word fervent is strong. We know that in James 5, 16, the effectual and what? Fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. So things that are fervent has energy, passion. Okay? And so Peter's saying to us, listen, have some fervent love for one another, so that the cross of Christ is not in vain. So serious is this that Christ makes it a commandment. Okay? John chapter 13, turn there. John chapter 
13. John chapter 13. 34. Everybody there? A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for the other. Biblical love doesn't require an emotional attachment. So we just get to, let's, let's understand that. It doesn't require an emotional attachment. Biblical love is predicated on a decision, not necessarily on an emotion. The decision to passionately and righteously seek the well-being of another person. So with that in mind, Christ makes it a commandment, not an option. He says that you have love one for the other. And this is a public thing. How do you know it's public? He said that the world may know. Amen. See, if you display love one to another, everybody gets to see that. You see, so, so this is something that we're not hiding under a bushel. This is something we're not sneaking around doing. We are passionately involved in our relationships with one another. And by that, the world will know that you are my disciples. Now, he didn't say, and the preaching and the teaching will win them over. He said, it's the love that will do it. You see, here's the deal. I can say I love you all day long, but if I'm acting a fool, it don't make no difference. Okay? You're not paying attention to what I say. You're paying attention to what I do. Okay? So I can't act a fool and then, and then tell you I love you because it doesn't matter. The old adage, action, what? Speaks louder than words. So it's about what I do. Jesus said, yeah, teaching is important. Of course. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You've got to know the word. But ain't nobody going to pay attention to what you say. If you act in a fool, they're not going to do that. See, we're the only Bible that most people are going to read. You can quote all the scripture you want, but act a fool and people see you as a hypocrite. So Jesus says, live right. Do right. When you love one another, it takes away selfishness. You watch little children. You, they have something. They want it and want yours too. They can't hardly play with each other. It's mine. It's mine. No, it's not. That's Pookie's. No, it's mine. It's mine. And when you teach them how to love right and they share, what a beautiful thing to see children sharing. Because they now, now have lost that selfishness. OK. And so when we when we're loving like we're supposed to, we're reaching out to others sometime at the expense of ourselves because we are trying to help one another. OK. So this principle becomes critical. All right. So if Jesus said, you know, it didn't have anything to do with how you like somebody. This ain't got to do with liking. OK. That's why he could say love your enemies. Isn't that right? So if somebody's an enemy of yours, you don't like them, but you can love them. Because okay? when you love an enemy, a couple things happen. First thing is that anybody that you, that's your enemy, uh, you probably don't like. Hello, you probably don't like them if they're your enemy. But you can still love them. And the other thing is, uh, you know, if you do something for somebody who's an enemy, you don't expect anything back in return. And that's the best love to have. See, when you do stuff without expecting things back, okay, that's the best love to have. It doesn't have any conditions to it. Okay, all right? Now, this time of the year, everybody's expecting something. 
I didn't give you some gifts. Can't nobody give me one. Now, I understand all of that. Okay? But the point is, when we give, we ought to be giving, not expecting anything in return. If we get it, it's all good. But it ain't, we ain't giving it just to get something. So, it is with our love. 2 Corinthians 3, 2 says, You are epistles written in our hearts, known and read among men. People are going to pay attention to how you live. And not necessarily what you say. Amen. So when we live right, now it helps us to teach folk because they know that our words and our life match. Okay? And then there's no hip hypocrisy connected to that. Is that all right? Amen. So remember, displaying love is not connected to uh, how we are treated by other people. Because if God had awaited for us to treat him right, to love him back, he may never have come to earth. Romans 5 8 says, For while we were yet sinners, Christ did what? Died for us. So while we was out there acting a fool, Christ was able to forgive us or to love us enough to come and give his life for us despite us being in our sins. So with that attitude that Christ displayed, uh, it teaches us to be obedient to the word of God. Now, John, listening to this, now this conversation that Jesus is having with them is in the upper room right before he's about to go die on the cross. So it's one of the last things he says to him, says to them before his death. That you love one another. And that's why this thing is so serious. It's so important. It says, listen, before I, I need you to understand this, before I leave, it's going to be the love that's going to bring people to me. So knowing that is a command of ours, we beseech you, brethren, to do thus. Now, let's turn to 1 John. Because John is the epistle of love and uh, the apostle of love, and he devotes a whole book to this love business, okay? Remember, uh, he referred to himself as apostle that what? That Jesus loved, didn't he? Okay? And it's believed that John was probably the closest to Christ of all the disciples. We read in Scripture that his head was on the bosom of Christ. They were close together, okay? So... Having heard this discourse, decides to write an entire book. And 1 John is the book that we are referring to. 1 John chapter 2. We're going to read three verses, eight, four verses, 8, 9, 10, and 11. 1 John 2, 8 through 11. Here is the first point that we're going to make today about this love business and how serious it is. Everybody there say amen. amen. Okay. Again, a new commandment. I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says, he is in the light and hates his brother, is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, this is serious. John says that if you don't have love for one another, you are in where? Darkness. darkness. Okay? Now, understand this. If you are in darkness and God is light and in him is no darkness at all, God is in the light sphere. You are in the darkness sphere. So where is God when you're relating to him? If you are in darkness, who are you praying to? 
Because God ain't there. God is where? In the light. And in him is no darkness at all. So God is here in the light. You are here in the darkness. There is no fellowship or communion with light and darkness. So where is God when you are calling on him? This is serious. So serious that you can separate yourself from God because you want to act a fool with other people. John says, okay, do that. But then you won't have God in your fellowship. You won't be able to commune with him. All right? So, so make a decision. You want to act a fool, be honorary, don't nobody like you, and you don't like nobody? Go ahead. Be in darkness by yourself. Because God ain't having no, uh, no connection with that. He is not posting up, abiding with you in darkness, because he doesn't do that. Who in here has teenage kids? A few of y'all. Teenage kids don't need their parents anymore. Long as they got a smartphone, okay, and an iPad and a computer. They don't need you. They in their room, in their world, and won't come out until it's time to get something to eat. Okay. Okay. They don't need you until it's time to eat. So what they do? Come down from their room. You ain't seen them all day, Shannon. And here they come. All right? And you're trying to figure out, where you been all day? Why you ain't? Uh, I'm, I'm all right. I'm all right. They got them things in their ear. The beats on their head and the things in their ear. You trying to talk to them. They can't hear you because they listening to stuff, something so loud. You wonder where, if you're going to play it that loud, just take them off. I can hear it across the street in your beats or whatever you're wearing. So they get their food and do what? Go back upstairs. Okay? They don't need you. Now I got to call them the I call them the four F's or the five F's. Okay? The kids don't need you until it's time for food. They don't need you until it's time for some funds. They don't need you till they want to go have some fun with their friends. Now we want them to have the fifth F. Family, but they don't want to have family because they want to have everything else but that, okay, until they need something, okay? Now, Christians who come to church just for food, and don't want to have the family, it's just like the teenager who comes down from the room to get food and go back to their room. When you hightail it out of here after worship to your car without any family interaction, without any family connectedness, you are just like the child who comes down looking for something to put in their hand so that they can leave and go on and do whatever they're doing. You can't cultivate love if you're not interacting with nobody. You're trying to get out of here. You're just like the child. You need, we need to cultivate relationships. Why? So when it's time to love one another, we've got something to work with. I don't know nothing about you because I don't ever talk to you. I don't ever see you. Every time I look around, you in your car, burning rubber out the parking lot. About to run over the kids, because they running around out there. Slow down, people. Interact with somebody. We can't love each other if we ain't cultivating relationships. Last point. I told you we're going to have a short flight. 
Okay? I want you now to just flip over a couple of pages in John to chapter 4. Okay? To chapter 4. First John 4, 17. Try to make it easy on you so you don't have to flip all over the place. Make it, make it easy for you to find the scriptures. So we're going to we'll stand in John. 1 John 4, 17. If you have a say amen. amen. Love has been perfected among us in this that we might have boldness in the day of judgment. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 and other scriptures say that we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for the deeds done in this body, whether they be good or bad. Okay? We got to stand before the Lord one day to give an account for our life. Okay? Yesterday, my wife and I were running around trying to look for a flat screen TV so we could put in the nursery. We went to Best Buy, H.H. H. H. Gregg, and uh, Walmart, trying to find. And we saw some TVs, man. <laughs> Big old fat screen, so clear. I mean, it was like it was real life, Sister Mary. Then you got to pay $5,000 for them. <laughs> I mean, man, is that picture clear, Murray? Whoa! And I got to thinking. In the day of judgment, there's going to be a big old flat screen in the day of judgment. Okay? This screen going to come down. And everything that we've done, said, and thought going to be on the big screen. So if it's HD here on earth, this is going to be quadruple HD in the day of judgment. It's going to be real clear. Okay? I would pull it down. I might step on this chair and fall in the baptismal pool, so I don't want to do that. I'm going to just let you lose your imagination. Here come the screen down, y'all, okay? And we're watching the life. The life and times of Brother Willie J. Smith on the screen. Maurice is in the booth running the show. The AV man. He AV in there. He'd be AV in their judgment. Okay. All right. Running the screen. Okay, my life on there. And I'm nervous, Shannon, because there's some things I done thought I ain't got no business thinking. There's some things I have done I ain't had no business doing. Yeah, there's some words I have said that I ain't had no business saying, Jasmine. So I'm a little nervous here with that screen coming down to see the life and times of Brother Willie Smith. Yes, indeed. I got, a, I got a real familiar name. Maybe they'll get me mixed up with Will Smith, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Get him out of here. <laughs> but he'll have my full name. So he know that's Jay. That's you. Oh, man, I thought it was him. Ow. Most of y'all know that I, I coach football. During this time of the year, UConn, the football guys want to wanna, wanna get a highlight tape so that they can send it off to colleges to try to get scholarships. Some of you understand what we're saying. Coral, you understand what I'm saying? Okay? Now, they want the highlight tape to go out. And uh, so I tell them, I said, well, you know what? Urban Meyer and then Antonio and Bob Stoops and all them guys, they have an open account that they can not just see your highlight tape. So your highlight tape just got all the good stuff on it, you see. Now your game tape got the blocks you missed, the balls you dropped, okay, the tackles you missed. It's got good and bad, okay. I said when the Urban Meyer got a tape, it's got everything on it. But coach just sent him the highlight tape. Because we want 
all the good on the highlight tape to kind of sway some of that bad stuff off so he can look and say, well, he did make a lot of good plays. I think he's all right for us to take. So your highlight tape can sometimes overrule a little bit of the bad stuff on your game tape, Monty. Okay? All right? I want you to get the visual here. All right. Judgment seat of Christ. Big chair for Jesus. Okay. All right. Judgment seat of Christ. All right. Jesus in the big chair. I guess John will sit on his right hand. He was arguing about it in the, on, on earth, right? Who's going to sit on your right hand, God, in the day? Okay. John, you go ahead and have a seat because we need to quote your scripture anyway. Uh, I'll sit down here, Jesus. That's all right. I'll sit on this seat. Is that okay? I'll sit here. So I'm sitting there and they go to screen and they go to movie. And oh, I'm nervous, Jesus. I'm nervous. Jesus, we, we don't have to waste time on my life tape because I know that's messed up. Okay. But, but Jesus, I, John said that in verse 17 that love has been perfected among us in this that we might have boldness in the day of judgment. I got a highlight take on love that's going to help me get through because I can stand in front of Jesus with confidence because I love the way I was supposed to love. So John says, if you want some extra credit, some bonus points, you need to make you a DVD of love. Get you a love tape. Maurice, don't play the life tape. Got a love tape. Put that in. Because I love the way I was supposed to love. Jesus, I got four sections on this tape. Y'all stay with me now. I got four sections on this tape. The, the first one, Jesus, is, uh, is my love for my coworkers on my job. And for the last three years, I had a principal and a secretary that tried to get me fired almost on a daily basis. And I'd come home sometime, sort of beat up and beat down. And my wife would be wondering what was going on. I'd tell her the story. After a few times, she decided she had enough. I'm going to call Crystal Angelina. Uh, we'll go up to that school. And we'll take care of things. You don't want Crystal leading the, leading the background. <laughs> Crystal don't play. Right. Uh, no, 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 daughters. I appreciate you. But no, no, don't come up here. We don't want to have to be going down to Marysville once a month. Holding the prison ministry because you done hurt somebody. But just the other day, right before Christmas break, the secretary who had been scheming and conniving against me for the last three years walked up to me and gave me a hug. I was surprised as I could be. But see, I loved her through all that mess. The principal on the last day of school, Brother Richard, ain't been 10 feet of me in three years, walked up to me, gave me a hug. Right, right. Now I'm real nervous now because, you know, Judas gave Jesus a hug and a kiss. Right. And you know what happened there. So I'm looking around for the superintendent. They about to jam me up. But I was able to walk out of there, UConn, all right. Because I love her. I love them through all that mess, Jesus, that's session one. Session two is my love that I displayed for all the people in the world. See, people in the world took my Christian love for weakness. They'll take advantage of you, okay? And, and you know sometimes even when they're trying to do it, but you want to do God's will anyway. So I just loved them anyway and loved them through it. Session three has to do with my love for the people in the church. Okay? Now, sometimes people in the church act worse than the people in the world. Anyway. All right? But I love them through all of that mess. All right? That's session three. 
Session number four is my love I have for my wife. Now, I'm so glad, Jesus, that you give long suffering. Long suffering. Because you know how hard it is to love my wife. Oh, but you give me long suffering. And I'm so thankful to you. I didn't love to throw it anyway. Some days I felt like Adam when he was talking to you about Eve when he said, that woman you gave me didn't make me sin. And there were days I look up to you, Lord, that woman you gave me driving me crazy. But I loved her anyway. Jesus, which tape you want to watch? Got a love tape. And if you like me, you need some bonus points too. Amen. If you like me, you need some extra credit. You better get you a love tape. Start working on that love tape. John said, love perfected will give us confidence in the day of judgment. But when you're standing before Jesus, you can talk about your love that you had for mankind. Get you a love tape. You get your love tape. And before you close the Lamb's Book of Life, get your name in it. Because this love thing is serious. It's so serious that it gives us confidence in the day of judgment to talk to Jesus. I need some extra points, Craig. Come on now. Can I thank you? I, I'm glad I ain't the only one needs some need some extra credit. Ain't but about two or three of us that don't need nothing. The rest of us need a tape. You better get you one and start working on it. And that'll help in those times. God help us to love one another the way he would have us to love. Well, I can't love everybody. Well, you can love somebody. Okay? Now, Bible says, let us do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. What we're dealing with this morning is all the household of faith people. Tonight, we'll deal with how we deal with the world and who we love, how we love, when we love. Because we don't know, when do I help such and such? Who do I get? I ain't got all, I, 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 it, it, it's, I don't know what to do. There is a guideline and prescription that the Bible gives us. Who to help, when to help, and how to help. You got to get that tonight. If you never come to evening worship, this, this needs to be the night you come. So now when you put this morning together with tonight, you're going to have the total picture. Figure out a way to be here so you can get tonight's less so you'll know what to do. If you're not a Christian today, when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, it's going to be real quick. Depart from me, worker of iniquity. I never knew you. And that ain't what you want to hear. You want to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Okay? So if, if you're not a Christian, you already know that your faith going to be in the day of judgment. Okay? All right? So you need to become a Christian. Now here's when you hear the word. Okay? You've heard enough and maybe you've been studying with someone else. Uh, that you're not ready to accept what you've heard, all right? And, and you, you have faith in what you've heard. Faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And then you want to believe. We want you to believe what you've heard, okay? Speaking of love, God so loved the world that he did what? Gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So that belief gives you the opportunity for eternal life. But that's not all you need to do. You need to now repent, change your life. Except you likewise repent, you will likewise reperish. Romans 13, 3. You've got to change your life. You've got to turn into a loving person. Okay? All right? And then you make that confession. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. And be buried in the watery grave of baptism. For the remission of your sins, for he that is baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's what you need. Now you're in a position to hear the words, well done.
thy good and faithful servant. Okay? Now, you're a member of the church and you need prayer. Come on up so we can pray with you and pray for you. That's why we're here. So we can cultivate our love for you and to, and to help you through whatever process you need, whatever crisis you're going through. We're going to pray with you and support you in that endeavor. Okay? If you've sinned, you've fallen short of, of the word of God, uh, you can make that confession and, and the effectual and fervent prayer of the righteous will avail of much. We'll pray for your cleansing and your forgiveness of your sins. Okay? Now we're in position to love. See? And that's what God wants us to do. All right? So if you stand in need of the Savior's invitation in any way, come forth now as we stand and sing the song of invitation.